At the end of the previous video, we saw that by iterating synthetic division, we could break a polynomial into its component parts. Specifically, we took this polynomial g and divided it by x minus 1. When we got a remainder of 0, we knew that we had divided evenly into g, and we could proceed by dividing by x minus 2, where we also got a remainder of 0, and dividing by x minus 3, where we also got a remainder of 0, and found out that we could then write the polynomial in this form, x minus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 3. In this video, we want to answer this question. What might we create by iterating not synthetic division, but synthetic substitution? In other words, whereas we, in the last video, looked upon each line of Horner as being synthetic division, we now want to look upon each line or each iteration as being a synthetic substitution of some value in so that we get some function value here on the right side. So let's get started by making up some function which we can use to iterate Horner. So let's say x to the third plus maybe 2x squared plus 3x plus 4. So we write in our coefficients. We make up some random value, let's say negative 1, to substitute in. We carry, we multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, and add. And we get an answer for the first run-through of Horner. So that would be f of negative 1. Right, that would just be f of negative 1. That is, if we interpreted that as being synthetic substitution, that is the answer we would get. If we wanted to interpret this as synthetic division, then we would have just divided f by x minus negative 1. So in other words, just x plus 1, right? x plus 1. And we got an answer, so this would be our quotient. Right, so that would be x squared plus x plus 2. Right, that would be our answer. x squared plus x plus 2. With a remainder of 2 as well. Right, this would also be our remainder. Actually, let's give all these things names. Let's call that r for the remainder. And we'll call this quotient here q. Maybe that's what we what we substituted in there we'll call P. Which means we could also write this somewhat more abstractly with X minus P dividing into F and we get Q plus some remainder R. Right? Okay, so that's as much as we've determined up till now. Now we want to iterate. So let's make up some other random number. Let's say this time we'll substitute in a negative 2. Now who knows if that is going to help us at all, but let's just try that. And we'll call that, let's call it p-bar. So we carry and multiply and add and multiply and add. Okay, so we got something here. Now although we're the ones who did it, we have no idea what we just did. So it won't be that helpful for us to ask what that means until we find out a little bit more about what we've done. So what plays a role here in even getting this answer? If I look at this computation here, the first thing that jumps out at me is that this number here did not play a role. Right? So if this is the second iteration of Horner, this number here really plays no role in that. In other words, if we would have even, we could have even made up a different function, right? For example, f sub 2 of x, we could have said, we'll keep the beginning the same, 
and instead of a plus 4 we'll write maybe a plus 5 right then the only thing that would have changed is we would have had a 3 here right instead of a uh, 2 but this here it wouldn't have changed at all so the constant term of our function plays no role why don't we take a, uh, take note of that we'll say constant term plays no role in the further iteration of Horner. Okay, so what does play a role? Well, obviously Q plays a role, right? That's all these values here. And our P bar plays a role because we're multiplying by it. So Q plays a role and uh, P, P bar also plays a role. Okay, well, now we've iterated Horner. We don't seem to be much further, but we have noticed a couple interesting things. It is at this point in the video when we would need a good idea. We need a good idea. And lucky for us, somebody at some point had a good idea. A mesmerizingly beautiful idea. So let's go through what their idea was. The first thing that they decided to do was to write f in a different way. Okay? So instead of writing f as we wrote it before, they said, let's get rid of that. and we will write it according to what we determined through the first iteration of Horner. In other words, if we rearrange these numbers here, we determine that f is just x minus p times q of x plus some remainder r. And we incorporated q into our computation by doing that. So we've got our first check mark here. We have incorporated Q. Now the next idea that they had was to take the derivative of both sides. Now why might they want to take the derivative? Well if you look back at these functions that we made up before, we see that they are identical except for the constant term. So we could make up infinitely many of these functions, right? We could call this one f sub 3. We'll make sure the beginning is the same. And then we could say minus 37 fourths times pi to the eth power, for example. And that would also give us the exact same further calculation, right? The only thing it would change here was the number in this box. That's all. But the second iteration of Horner would remain unchanged. So of all these infinite functions that we could make up that just had different constants, what is it that they have in common? Their derivative is, is the same, right? So if one of these functions were graphed like this, well then the next one would just look like this, and the next one would look like this, right? They're all just the same function, just shifted. So they have the same derivative. So that might explain the connection to the derivative. And here I was wanting to circle this. Now why am I wanting to circle this? Well, before I do that completely, let's take a look at why. So let's indeed take the derivative here. So that would be, if we're using the product rule, the derivative of x minus p times q of x plus x minus p as is times the derivative of q of x plus the derivative of r. So if we simplify, the derivative of that is 1. So we're just left with q of x plus x minus p times q prime of x plus the derivative of a constant is, of course, 0, right? So we can leave that off. And we do indeed now get our check, second check mark. By taking the derivative, 
we made sure that the constant term plays no role in the further computations. So at the present time, it looks as if we could compute f prime of x for all x. Uh, let's take a look if that is indeed the case. So do we know q? Yes, we know q. q is just the first quotient that arose in the first iteration of Horner. So we know q. Do we know p? Well, yes, we know p. We made up p ourselves, right? That's just the value that we substituted in. So do we know q prime of x? No, we do not know that, do we? We know q, right? This is q. And we know f, right? This was, these are just the coefficients of f. But our calculations are now telling us that in order to know f prime, so the derivative of this, we're going to have to know q prime, that is, the derivative of this. But we don't know q prime. Presumably, in order to know q prime, we would have to know the derivative of this, which we don't know. So that's not going to work. We can't keep on going further and further and further and further and getting further away from f and not finding our answer. So we're going to have to s look for a different solution. But if we look back, we see that this f bar is still here. So somehow we still need to sub in something for for p bar, sorry, for p bar. p bar is still there. And we have this pesky q prime of x. So maybe we could combine these two problems into one big solution. What if we subbed in p here? Then we would get a zero here, right? And if we multiplied that times this q prime of x, then that would just disappear. In other words, if we give up our dream of wanting to calculate f prime of x for all x, we could write that this way. f prime of p, so we're going to substitute in for p, then we get q of p plus p minus p times q prime of p. Now, we don't know q prime of p, of course, but we don't need to because this is 0, which makes sure that all of this disappears, and we end up with q of p. In other words, if we want to know the first derivative of f at p, we just have to say what q of p is. That's pretty nifty. Now, can we calculate that? Well, we know q, and we know p. Do we have a way of substituting p into q? I'll give you one hint. Horner, right? This is q. So if we just now use Horner to substitute p in, right? In other words, we're substituting p in for p bar, then we'll have exactly what we need. So let's delete all this mumbo jumbo that we made up when we didn't know what we were talking about. And we'll substitute in p, right? So this negative 1. So we write in negative 1. We carry, we multiply, we add we multiply and we add and we find out that the answer for f prime of negative one is two so we should check and see if that's the right answer but before we do we get our third check mark right we have now incorporated all three of these ideas into our solution which we have also proved right but we haven't shown yet that we actually got the right answer for this simple problem. So let's check that. So this was a f of x. So let's say f prime of x is 3x squared, right? I'm just taking the derivative, plus 4x plus 3. So f prime of negative 1 would be negative 1 squared would be 1 times 3 plus 4 times negative 1, so that would be just minus 4, and then plus 3. So yes, indeed, we end up with 2. We got exactly the answer that we wanted to get. And not only that, but we've proved that we will always get this answer. So let's use our newfound knowledge 
and see how fast we can find out f2 and so f of 2 and f prime of 2. Let's see how fast we can do that. So we substitute in our 2 and they're off. Carry, multiply, 0, 0, 3, 6, 2, 4, 9, 18, 12. We know that f of 2 is equal to 12. Now we continue with the second iteration of Horner. Carry, multiply, add, 4, 7, 14, 16, 32, and 41. And now, just like that, we know f prime of 2. Now, we're through. That's what we wanted to know. But wouldn't it be nice if we could keep going, right? We carry and do our magic here. And somehow, at the end of the line, f double prime of 2 came out. And wouldn't it be nice if we could keep going and at some point we could have the nth derivative of f at 2? That would be great if we could do that. Now we haven't proved that we can and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, maybe we have to do something slightly different. But that sounds like the subject of a further video. At this point let's look at something else real quick. We see here on the left that we always have the same value and that on the right we can have different values. Now if we look back at the method that we talked about at the end of the last video we saw that on the right we always had the same value namely 0 and on the right we could have different values on the left we could have different values right so whereas in our new method the left was the same and the right could be different in the old method the right was the same and the left could be different and we see also in in this case in the case that we talked about in the last video we see why it has to be a zero here right because if you divide by something and you don't get a remainder of zero, then that means you haven't divided evenly. That means you haven't found a factor. So that's why you have to have a zero here. Now in our new method, we've seen that we also have the same value, but just this time on the left. And the reason for that is just that's the way it worked out, right? We saw that if we subbed in this p, that's the only way we could get this thing to disappear. So we were forced to have the same value on the left. So let's look at one last thing before we close up shop about this function that we just evaluated. We see this graph of f prime here. In other words, that's the graph of, uh, I'm just taking the derivative here, 5x five, five to the fourth minus 8x to the third plus that would be 9x squared minus 8x plus 5, right? That graph there was not used anywhere in our computations up here. F is nowhere, F prime is nowhere to be seen here. We only used Q. Q is the first quotient that appears during the first iteration of Horner. All we needed was q. We did not need to know f prime of x for all x. We just needed q because the graph of q and f prime cross at exactly that point that we were wanting to know at p. So we can indeed iterate synthetic substitution. And using it, we can find the derivative f prime of p without having to know f prime for all x.